So greetings, people who are logging in. Hello, hello. This is Alex Kosorek, the Vice President for the AES for the Western Region of the United States and Canada, welcoming you all. Uh, we are just waiting for our attendees to uh, join us. And I will give another, well, let's say two more minutes before I'll go through a few housekeeping things and then we will get started. So bear with us for just another minute or two, please. That'll give me time to finish my, finish my lozenge. <laughs> I won't be sucking on lozenges the whole night, so just one. Hmm. Ricola. <laughs> Good stuff. Nice. <clears throat> I just ate a bunch of corn chips, so I gotta have a lozenge. So say now we have to have that big instrument that makes a big huge sound. Give one more minute here. Yes, we are going to be yodeling this evening. We'll see. <laughs> well, since I do know there's a few other housekeeping things after uh, as far as uh, section business to take care of and so and so forth, I'm going to get this uh, party started a little bit. So, so those of you who are joining us thus far, again, my name is Alex Kosorek. I'm the Western uh, VP, or I should say the regional VP for the Western region of the United States and Canada for the Audio Engineering Society. Say that 10 times fast. And I'm going to be turning this over to Greg Dixon very shortly, who is the chair of the Pacific Northwest region. But first of all, for questions and uh, getting answers to your questions, we ask that you please use the Q&A module in Zoom, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen that you're viewing now. You'll hit the little Q&A button and ask your question there. Uh, once questions are presented, then they'll be actually viewable by all of the uh, panelists and all of the attendees at that particular point in time. The chat window, you're more than welcome to say hello and chit chat with each other there. But please note that if you ask a question there, it might get overlooked. So reminder, use that Q&A module. With that said, I'm going to mute myself, turn off my uh, camera and so on and so forth, and introduce you to the Pacific Northwest Chair, Greg Dis Dixon. Take it away, Greg. Thank you, Alex. Uh, welcome, everybody. So good to be here with you tonight. Um, my name is Greg Dixon, as Alex mentioned. I am the chair of the Pacific Northwest section. And um, we're very excited tonight to have uh, Chris Ballou with us um, presenting the meeting on recording songs with Casper Baby Pants. Um, I can't wait to share. Uh, I can't wait to see what Chris has to share with all of us tonight. And we're really excited to have Chris here with us. Um, I just need to go over a few items of business um, before we begin. The first relates to our section. In terms of section business, um, this year we have an election coming up in June. And um, for the election, we currently are looking for potential candidates that may be interested in being a committee member. So if you are interested in um, becoming more involved with the Pacific Northwest AES section, uh, please consider um, putting your name in to run for a committee position. In order to do that, you'll likely want to just go to our section website and you can find a link on the website that says officers contact list. And if you know um, any of the officers on the list, you can send them an email, letting, letting them know your interest in running um, as a committee person for the June election. Next month at our next meeting, which currently is not scheduled, but once we have it, we will announce the slate of candidates for the June election. Um, I'd like to turn over the time now to Dan to talk about uh, tea time topics, the initiative that he has been doing weekly since um, last spring. So Dan. Great, thanks, Greg. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the meeting here. Yeah, every Saturday at 3.30 Pacific time, uh, we get together and talk about whatever subjects come up. 
uh, uh, we have this is uh, this one this Saturday is going to be number 43 in the series, which is pretty amazing. And uh, Gordon uh, McGregor from Scotland is going to talk about a small install for live streaming that he's doing in a wee church in Greater Scotland Shower. He's from Glasgow. And uh, I'm going to show some pictures. Uh, I'm going to show a video of Frank Laco, who was our late friend, who was a recording engineer at the 30th Street Studio for 30 some years and was did all of Tony Bennett's albums and a bunch with Miles Davis and a bunch of other people. And uh, Bob Smith and I made a video commem uh, commemorating his career when he was inducted to the AES Honorary Member uh, Award when he got that and uh, talk a little bit about 30th Street. And we talk about whatever else comes up and it's free and it's interesting and fun. It starts at 3.30, like I say, I open the doors at three and uh, I try to get people to stop at seven, which is crazy, but it's really hard and people are involved. So if you want to uh, email me and chat, or I guess send a chat with your email address and tell me you want to be part of it, I'll send you the Zoom link. So uh, that's it, thank you. Back to Greg. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'd also like to um, introduce our moderator tonight, Matt Stearns, who is a committee member uh, on the Pacific North Northwest AES Section Committee. Matt will be helping us tonight um, kind of forward your questions to Chris. So thank you, Matt, for all your help with that. At this point in time, I'm going to introduce Chris. All right, so Casper, as we said tonight, the meeting is called Recording Songs with Casper Baby Pants. Casper Baby Pants is also known as Chris Ballou. Chris is the three-time Grammy-nominated singer and songwriter um, for the four times platinum Seattle-based rock and roll group, the Presidents of the United States of America. Since two, 2009, he's embarked on a project called Casper Baby Pants, a children's project, and he's released 18 albums of music since 2009. In addition, uh, Chris has had experience writing children's books and working with his wife, Kate Endel. Kate illustrates the books that, that Chris has written. Just recently, Chris's 18th album, Happy Heart, came out in November, on November 13th of 2020. Chris, we're so excited to have you here tonight, and thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy life to come tell us about what you do, and uh, so thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, I'll admit uh, right at the top that I don't really know what I'm doing here, <laughs> because my um, the scope of my skills as far as being an audio engineer are pretty pretty small. But I find I think it could be interesting for people because they're small, uh, and yet I can still make records that uh, you know work in the world and uh, sound good. So um, I guess maybe I'll just give a little overview about my experience recording uh, in my life. Uh, it started out when I was about I think uh, maybe 11 or 12, 13 years old. I had a, a boombox, and my mom had a boombox, and so I used to record, you know one guitar on one boom box and play it back while I was doing something in the room that get recorded on the other boom box and back and forth. And I have those recordings, a lot of them still, and they're just ridiculously compressed, kind of in a great way. I, I, I think sometimes about mastering songs by just going boom box to boom box and seeing if I could recreate that kind of crushed tape sensation. But that was my, I was, I was hungry to like layer sounds and figure out how sounds would, you know, work together and uh, but of course I was, you know, hampered by no technology at all. So I kind of learned from an early age how to dive in anyway, even if I didn't have the right gear or any gear at all. Um, eventually my mom <laughs> took pity on me and bought me a four track. It was an old Ross four track and it sounded great. It was a real workhorse. Uh, I, I went through a bunch of four tracks over the next, you know, 10 or 15 years and, and was happy with that really. Um, 
and that was just me you know one mic uh my four track my headphones a couple of little monitors that i used uh and i wasn't really releasing things although there was a a cassette um magazine called gajube it was a fanzine where you could send in your cassette and people would then send you a check for five dollars and you'd send them your cassette um and so that was kind of my first taste of, of do-it-yourself distribution, kind of. So I've got the do-it-yourself recording. I've got the do-it-yourself distribution. I'm kind of feeling this, this uh, comfort with that kind of, uh, you know, uh, level of, of uh, expertise, I guess, or commitment. Um, eventually, uh, I ended up hanging out with a guy named Mark Sandman from a band called Morphine in Boston, Massachusetts, where I went after college. And he uh, not only turned me on to playing instruments with only two strings, which is one of the major sounds of the Casper thing and the president's thing, but he also turned me on to eight track cassette. And that blew my mind because up until then I had been, as the Beatles did with Sgt. Peppers and a few other things, uh, I was judiciously reducing, you know, three tracks to one and then record on two and reduce them to the third and then reduce the third and the fourth to the first. I was constantly like, you know, planning out and, and planning ahead for what I wanted to do so I could pile tracks on top of each other. So the eight track cassette really blew my mind, but outboard gear wise, I didn't change much. I really just had a mic and, you know, I started to have outboard effects like a tape echo and things like that. But I wasn't getting into compressing the signal before going into the A-Track yet. And then I did start buying really fancy compressor. I don't remember what that compressor was, but it was super, it was like a $5,000 compressor, which was kind of silly to be using with an A-Track cassette recorder. But I got great results and people said they loved the sounds. And I started, you know, kind of releasing uh, a little bit of stuff here and there. And then, of course, during that time, the presidents hit and we ended up uh, recording in uh, a friend's basement, basically. Uh, Conrad Uno ran a ba uh, studio called Egg. It was 16 track tape. And then we got, you know, signed and everything. And we ended up in big studios with 24 track machines and all the outboard gear and everything. And frankly, I found having come from such a do it yourself kind of, you know, trial and error background, I found the big studios daunting. I also found the time issue daunting because uh, I couldn't quite figure out how to like go make a record. And then you, you, know, you get in there, you start and then you finish and the record's done. You've got 10 days or two weeks or whatever it is. Um, and I figured that out later, but I'll get to that. So, uh, so we're recording in these big studios and I just, I kind of, I took a little bit of sort of clues from that to buy some outboard gear but really i kept it down to the bare minimum uh all through that experience too eventually i was in a band with sir mix a lot uh during the early 2000s and i was trying to demo songs for him to put lyrics on and i was using my eight track cassette and i'd go to him with a cassette and he'd be like i don't know how to play that what is that so he eventually uh bullied me in, no, he didn't bully me, but he, he was like, you got to get a computer, you got to get a Pro Tools set up, you got to, you know, if we're going to collaborate, this is what you got to do. So I was hesitant because I wasn't really sure about the visual part. He assured me I'd get over it, and boy, did I. And that has just blown the roof off of my creativity. Um, it's what I was trying to do all along with two boom boxes, four tracks, eight tracks, um, the freedom, the automation. Um, it turns out I'm very exacting when it comes to putting stuff together for release and the, you know, the, the ability to automate and, uh, really, you know, like have the mix sound exactly the same every time without having to kind of orchestrate fader moves every time I ran a mix was fantastic. So I've been really on that, on board with that ever since. And as a result, kind of my outboard gear really evaporated. And because I, I like I like what's in the box as far as Pro Tools goes, I kind of treat Pro treat Pro Tools like a glorified tape deck. I don't do a lot of I don't do any MIDI. I've never used MIDI in there. Uh, I really just use it as a tape deck and an editor, like as if I could go into a twenty four track tape and take bits and move them around. Um, 
And so with that in mind, I'm still using Pro Tools 9 on an old laptop from, well, let's see, I, my first lab, my first computer I got in 2001 or two, and it lasted like, I don't know, maybe until 2018 or something. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, 2008. And then I got this uh, new laptop and I just run an M Mbox. Um, I used the Digi 001 when it was fresh and now I use an Mbox and a Rode NT2 mic, not a fancy one. Um, and so for me, the experience of recording isn't much different from the boombox days because I'm using, you know, a decent kind of level of gear but I'm not really leaning on the gear that much. I really lean on my ears. And I also don't kind of uh, take a lot of time to get the right sound <laughs> because I'm the creative and I'm the engineer at the same time because I'm a, I'm a do-it-yourselfer. Um, I have to balance the two. And so what I've, I've decided to do is just allow myself to be really messy when I start writing songs. Um, and this is, is especially, um, important for the Casper baby pants thing, because in the end, I want a recording that's really airy and spacious and easy to get into for kids ears, easy to hear the story, hear the lyrics, but also for the adults, it needs to have some sort of like uh, musical aesthetic or a slight, slightly dense or complicated music or woven together riffs or whatever to keep the parents coming back. Because if the kid wants to hear the song a 100 times, the parent probably is going to hear it 97 of those times. So I try to really uh, balance those two. But so in the, in the beginning, when I'm recording, I just, I grab what I need. I don't think too hard. I have this mic in one spot in my studio right there. I don't move it to record the things. I move around the room in order to find the right sound. So I put on headphones. I move around with an acoustic guitar until, okay. And sometimes I'll mic the guitar from behind. Sometimes it's from above. But it really depends on that guitar, what I'm playing, and um, sort of how it feels. Uh, so yeah, a lot of times I'll just make a ton of sound to get going. And then I need time. Since I work alone, uh, it's super important that I don't try to you know, sit down one day and record a song and finish it and call it done. Um, I allow them to be messy and kind of overproduced and crazy. And then I sit on them. I kind of enjoy them in that state for a while because I like it, but I know that that's not how they'll actually leave to be used in the world. So time affords me the um, perspective that I need to divorce my ego from the recording. The, so, I, you know, if, if say a, a guitar part that's, you know, well recorded and sounds great, isn't serving the song, I have to come around to a, a spot where I've got to delete that guitar or get rid of it. And uh, I've learned over the years that I'm really not suited for a band because I don't want to explain why the guitar is getting muted to the guitar player. I just need to mute the guitar and not, you know, have a discussion about it. <laughs> so I love working alone because I love the autonomy of um, being ruthless with the mixes and with the clutter and the cleanup. I love uh, Ann Wilson from Heart called, uh, or sorry, Nancy Wilson from Heart called what I'm describing a mute party. So you get all your tracks, you make all your messes, and then you have a mute party and you just start muting and you start seeing like, what can I live without? And it's not uncommon for me to mute like a drum machine that's kind of clanky or something kind of in the highs that is obscuring the song. And then all of a sudden the song is there and it just breathes. And I'm like, there it is. So um, I love that kind of uh, hunting around for that that super delicate balance where the song's simple, but it's also kind of, you know, satisfyingly complex. Um, so one of my concepts with the Casper Baby Pants thing is when I did find that, you know, voice of making music for kids, which I didn't have before, I didn't plan on it. I just sort of found it because all the time I was in a rock band, I had this little message going through my system saying, you're supposed to be doing something else. This is great, but you're supposed to be doing something else. And I didn't know what it was. And I was experimenting on the side. Eventually, I found this really simple kind of uh, innocent style with acoustic guitars and ba upright basses and stuff like that, very electric piano, very open and simple. 
and I realized it's kids music that I should be doing. And then this just volcano of creativity started. And from the very beginning, I thought, I want people to be able to take any song off any Casper Baby Pants record and make their own compilation album and have it sound like an album. So I didn't want each album to be its own world sonically. So the first album was really uh, difficult to kind of pull together because I, I felt like I was establishing this like very specific palette of the low end and the high end and, and like how bright is the vocal and how am I going to play the loudness war? Am I going to try to like, you know, limit the thing to the threshold? Um, and I decided not to, you know, it's I, my volume over the 18 records has snuck up a little bit <laughs> just because that's a tough um it's tough sometimes to turn down that limiter because it feels so great when you turn it on. Uh, so it's, it's a balance. I test my mixes out in the world a lot. I used to, in the early days of Casper too, I would go to like car stereo stores and uh, pro audio stores and put my CD in the CD players at these places and test all the speakers out. And I was really looking for consistency, you know, looking for it to sound really the same uh, as far as how it hit me um, on a bunch of different systems. So I still do that. I still try it in the car. I have a Bose wave radio, you know, kind of a home system. I have like a Bluetooth speaker. Um, I got my laptop speakers. So I'm constantly like testing and listening. So that after the creativity and then the mute party, there's the sequencing of the albums. And that really, you know, is dependent on what songs are ready to go. I have this huge vat of songs that I'm working on all the time, this big folder. And so when it's time to make a record, I go through and listen to it all and, and identify the ones that are closest to completion. And those become the batch that gets whittled down to become an album. So I don't really sit down like I'm starting an album today. I just I just really scrape the cream off the top and release the best stuff I've got at any given time. I like doing it that way because songs get time to mature and fully bake, if you will. Uh, I find that if I, I rely a lot on a gut feeling, like sometimes I'll listen to a, what I think is an album and there's a song and just some feeling says it's not being presented exactly right. Maybe it's in the wrong key. Maybe it's supposed to be from the first person, not the third person. Maybe it's, uh, the arrangements weird. Maybe the instrumentation's weird. Um, and inevitably if I hold that song back, although it's painful, um, six months a year later I, I i crack the code and i figure out what was why my instinct was telling me to keep it off and i'm always glad i did so that's a real tough uh kind of you know tough love kind of thing i have to do with my own songs um so yeah uh i mean that kind of brings us up to the casper thing i, I these days i'm kind of making this new music that is uh not casper not presidents it's very kind of eclectic psychedelic groovy abstract i don't know it's pouring out of me and i'm recording it and i don't know why <laughs> i think i'm making a record but who knows um <clears throat> anyway i guess that kind of like that kind of paints the picture of where i'm coming from uh I think maybe it would be interesting to see if anybody has any questions about anything at all, like, you know, math questions, algebra, doing your homework, need some help. So, yeah. Hey, Chris, um, Perrin, five, age five, wants to know, how do you make electronic music? Oh, how do I make Well, very much, uh, very awkwardly. <laughs> Um, like I said, I use Pro Tools like a tape deck, so I don't use MIDI. I do. I just I manipulate audio a lot, so I'll get a little drum loop going on. A, uh, I have an iPad here that's got a Garage Band on it, and I use their beat sequencer in that. I throw it in Pro Tools as an audio file, and then I just uh, chop that. I might detune it or stretch it or mess with it in that environment so that it kind of starts to sound real alien. Um, so yeah, it's really just like recording a, you know, a acoustic ballad, except it's electronic and I'm, I'm just chopping and cutting. I mean, I get into like taking little tiny bits. I do this, uh, Pro Tools has this amazing thing called strip silence. So I can take a drum beat uh, from a record even and strip silence it. So it's just the kicks and the snares and then replace them with my own kicks and snares and then get rid of the original so that Led Zeppelin doesn't sue me. And uh, <laughs> 
and then stretch the time and change things around. But I'm kind of what I'm doing is hijacking the feeling. And I actually had a band with one of Mix's protégés called The Feelings Hijackers. And most of our songs were based on me taking uh, copyrighted material and kind of hijacking the feeling, just taking a, a measure and then building my own track and then re getting rid of the original and kind of letting it then go in completely new directions. So feelings hijacking is kind of a cornerstone of how I do the electronic stuff. Great. Uh, another question from Jack Quarantino. Quarantino. Yeah. Quarantino. Um, Hi, Jack. How have you upgraded your shack? Oh, uh, not at all. <laughs> My shack is just a, a, a building with full of guitars. And um, well, I built shelves for my CDs because <laughs> I'm a distributor. That's an upgrade. I built a little nap, nap, uh, nap cot back there so I can listen to mixes. Although that's not a good place to listen to mixes because the bass is really out of proportion. As we all know, you get to the back of a a room and it's uh, all bass. So yeah, not not much really. I, I you know, I I have different desks come and go, but otherwise same gear, same one mic. <laughs> I, I I don't know. There's more ants in here now. So uh can you can you talk for just a moment and introduce the um your uh Beatles songs, the projects that you've done that covers the Beatles? Oh yeah, that was fantastic. So um, one day I just started recording, what was the song? The first one I did, I think was um, All You Need Is Love. And it was when my studio was actually in the laundry room in the house, cause this wasn't built yet. I just felt compelled to cover that song. And I did a very simple, just like bass, a little ukulele kind of super simple electric piano version. And then it kind of occurred to me like, wow, that was fun because I didn't really adhere to their arrangement. I kind of, for kids, I kind of simplified the arrangement and shortened the song uh, for short, shorter attention spans and just kind of keeping the ball rolling. Anyway, that kind of like excited me. And I thought, well, what if I crack open another Beatles song? And I did. And I, and then I started going crazy with it. And um, it was interesting because I had to, the songs had to fit a certain criteria. I decided I'd use only songs that Lennon and McCartney actually wrote. So there'd be no twist and shout, uh, boys, you know, uh, all that stuff, like covers that they were doing. And then it had to have something to do with, um, you know, like the, I wanted the lyrics to be visual, kind of uh, like, you know, being for the benefit of Mr. Kite or, uh, or abstract, like everybody's got something to hide except me and my monkey, like just silly. They have a lot of really uh, surreal, silly songs. So I went with those. I stayed away from songs that were about romantic love, but a couple songs about romantic love were, or teenage, you know, desire, <laughs> were able to translate to a child, parent-child uh, uh, kind of relationship just by changing the music and making it more uh, delicate. Like I did the song Little Child, which in the original, it's just blasting. And I did like a kind of a, kind of a lullaby version and that just changed the meaning. So it was, and it was really, um, fascinating like because i i stripped these songs down to the bones you know I, i'd understand the chord progression i grew up with the song so i knew all the little hooks and bits that would catch my ear so i wanted those in there but opening those songs forensically and really looking at the chord changes and how the verses and courses were in different keys in some songs like penny lane um it was a huge revelation and i learned a lot from doing it that i applied to songwriting going forward after that so it was really like a tutorial for me and i did the one record and then i had so many songs that didn't make it on i eventually made a second record um they're baby beetles and beetles baby um so yeah that was a great experience and uh, a nice follow-up question to that chris barrett wants to know has sir paul heard your beatles covers well i know somebody who knows his guitar player <laughs> so they gave me his the guitar player's information i sent him the CDs, you know, with a handwritten note for Paul. Now I bet this guitar player gets, you know, 50 things a day to pass over to Paul. So uh, no word back yet on that, but that's okay. You know, my worst night were, my worst nightmare would be that he listens to it and doesn't like it. So in some funny way, I'm kind of, I'd rather he doesn't hear it. <laughs> so Paul, if you're watching, and I know you are, just forget everything I just said about the Beatles. Uh... Bruno Modello wants to know what tuning do you do with a two string? 
Oh, well, it used to be C sharp, G sharp. Uh, this is actually the guitar that I played on the debut record, and I'm using it again. I, I've been using it ever since. I bought it for $75 in a little music store in Boston, and it's been serving me ever since. So it used to be C sharp, G sharp, and the presidents, and we did not plan that. We just tuned... You know, we, we tuned the guitar to what felt good with the tension of the string and what felt good with my voice. And Mark Sandman had a box of strings and some calipers. And so we would experiment and then he'd use the calipers to figure out which, uh, you know, gauges we had settled on. So back in the president's days, I think it was 60 and 36. And now I tuned to D and A. And the three string version, this is my Casper guitar, the three string version is D A D which conveniently spells dad. So it's appropriate for kids music. And uh, yeah, I think the gauge is there is 52, 42, 32, no 30. Yeah, 52, 42, 30. Um, yeah, so that's the story with the two strings. Mark Sandman turned me onto it and, uh, and uh, I haven't looked back. Although I do play now with the music I'm doing now, I got, I got a six string. I know it's sacrilegious, but I'm doing it. Ugh. So, yeah, that's the story with that. Uh, so Simon H3 wants Chris to know that he's pretending to be Yoshi right now. And also his favorite song is Slugs in the Dust. Oh, Simon's I, parents also get a kick out of that song. I love, thank you, Simon, so much. I love that song. I wrote, that song took, now one of the other things I didn't mention is Sometimes songs take decades to finish. I am actually working on a song right now that I wrote in 1981. <laughs> so I'm still working on it. But that song, Slugs in the Dust, took about three years because I came up with the idea for the title. Then of course, immediately I thought, all we are are slugs in the dust, but I didn't want to do that. So I waited and waited for a musical kind of idea to pop up. And then I had to rewrite it and rewrite it to get the narrative right, to get the as much story as I could into a small space. I tinkered with the lyrics on that song endlessly. And so it's really nice to hear that it resonates with people because I, I almost fainted from exhaustion working on that song, getting it just right. So thank you, Simon. One more is uh, Chris Barrett wants you to know that uh, his daughter thinks that the Beatles cover your songs. <laughs> I've heard that before. And, you know, I'm, that's insanely flattering because I grew up listening to the Beatles exclusively till I was, I think, 10. I bought, uh, no, no, actually, I, I listened to the Beatles exclusively until I was about 13, actually. And then I branched out into Blue Oyster Cult. So, you know, there's no accounting for taste, but uh, although I love Blue Oyster Cult, their early records. Um, but yeah, the Beatles are just like in my DNA because they were there my entire ch my entire childhood. So uh, the thought that my versions could f function that way for little kids is incredibly satisfying and dear. So thank you. Uh, so Dan Karras uh, wants to know, do you have any acoustic treatments in your room? No. Well, not really. Like there's two by fours, like... So all the walls are exposed two by fours. We have the, I have the insulation and sheets on the outside of the building. So there's some natural baffling, I guess, but the room, uh, when I have a mic open and it feeds back, it feeds back on a perfect D. So, and I'm recording almost everything in D since I'm in open D all the time. Uh, not everything, but you know, it's there. So I, I always felt like I lucked out somehow the room resonates in D and everything I do is in D that becomes a problem actually with my nylon string guitar. Cause it gets really woofy. I have a hard time taming that, like finding a spot. I end up having to mic it like right by the headstock sometimes to get the, the woof out. But um, yeah, nothing planned. Uh, I never have. I've always just worked with the room I've got. And it is fun to work with the room. I, like I said, I leave the mic where it is. And if I'm doing backup vocals that I want to be kind of like, not, you know, right up front, I'll just go way back there and, and do them from behind or do it from the back of the room. So you, I, I move around the mic instead of moving the mics around. Did you initially have to experiment with that mic placement? No, it's just a good spot for it. <laughs> it's a good spot for it because I can prop my laptop with my lyrics up on my piano stand and sing while I can see the lyrics without wasting paper and printing out lyrics all the time. 
So it's kind of where it is because of where the piano stand is. So I know, you know, I bet if I, I bet if I really knew what I was doing, I'd reorganize the room and everything would sound way better, but <laughs> I don't know. So far it's sounding good. I think your instinct to, instinct is paying off. Right. Uh, so uh, a comment from Janie Wallach mm -hmm. wants to thanks, thank Chris for the time he graciously allowed me to record him at Northwest Folklife Festival. Oh, yeah. He was, he was playing at a stage without the PA. And because there were going to be so many toddlers dancing in front of the stage, I couldn't put the stereo mic in front of the stage. I would never have thought of putting it between the vocal mic and his guitar. And to my complete amazement, the recording turned out crystal clear, really clean, and is extremely listenable. Wow. So, cool. And again, I think that speaks to a good instinct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Thanks, Janie. Uh, Jim Ballard asks, what instruments do you play? And did you train to be uh, train as a musician? Or were you just born that way? Hmm. Kind of both. Um, uh, the story is that when I was about two, I think I got a hammer and was banging on the upright piano with a hammer because I just loved the sound of all those strings going crazy in there. And when I grew up, there were like divots all over the piano and everybody said that's what I was doing. So I started with that. I started trying to be John Cage when I was two years old. Uh, so, and two and a half is actually when I got Sgt. Pepper's. It came out in 67 and my brother bought it for my parents for Christmas and I inherited it. And uh, I didn't ever, I didn't let go of it for years. I thought that was the only record there was in the world <laughs> for a long time. Uh, but I then I got into piano at, at four years old. My mom started me on piano lessons and I did that for 10 years. And I was sort of, I was sort of like on track to be a concert pianist uh, as far as other people were concerned. But I just, it didn't resonate with me. I, I you know, I don't know. There was something, uh, it was too much. It was a lot of work. It was a lot of practicing, a lot of work. And reading sheet music never came easy to me. It was always very clunky and humped and pecky and, uh, but I did it for a long time, and then I picked up an electric guitar in uh, when I was about 13 or so, 14, and was like, oh yeah, that's way better. So I just uh, never, I, so I still have the piano thing, I have the piano chops. My dad was into country music growing up, and my mom was into classical, and so I've kind of got both of those things. And what's beautiful about the Casper Baby Pants thing is I get to put both of those influences on the records. Uh, and they can live in the same world. So I love putting strings. I have a few songs that quote uh, melodies from classical tunes because they're available to use and they're so familiar and great and, and uh, familiar to me too, having grown up with them. So uh, there was some training going on, but there was also just instinct and desire. Great. Uh, any plans for touring? No. Once COVID is over, of course. Uh, well, I'll probably go back to playing Casper Baby Pants shows here in the Northwest. I think I'm going to kind of reduce the number of shows. I think I'm going to focus more on indoor seated theaters and stuff like that, um, where I can, you know, kind of do the full range of, of songs, call and response activity, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll go back when the when the COVID's over. But the presidents we are done. We finished that in 2015. This new music I'm making, I don't know if I could tour on it. I, I'd need to hire like 15 people to be in my band because <laughs> it's so thick. Um, so yeah, Casper shows, sure. And um, I'm gonna just put out a message there that if you have questions now, would be a good time to put them into the Q&A window. As I'm down to my last question queued up here, uh, and it's uh, really more of a comment. Chris Barrett says, Chris, do an album of Lady Gaga covers next. <laughs> okay, I'll look into it. I mean, <laughs> it would be good. I have thought about doing, well, I've got a few covers uh, that I've recorded for, I think I'm going to make a Casper Baby Pants four song seven inch of covers. And they are, let's see, I did Queen, We Will Rock You, but I changed it to a lullaby. We will rock you. Um, I took Tom Petty's Free Fallen and turned it into Free Crawlin. I kind of weird alified these songs. <laughs> um, how were the others? Oh shoot, I can't remember the other two. It's been a while. I haven't, I haven't cracked that open for like a year. Or so anyway, I've got to, I've got to actually take a page out of Weird Al's playbook and uh, contact these people and see if it's okay with them to 
for me to change the, you know, the the lyrics a little bit. So I uh, uh, I was gonna uh, I'll, I'll give Lady Gaga a serious listen. Okay, I was gonna actually um, my own question to you was uh, how do you deal with the licensing aspects of covering songs that are not yeah, known? That's pretty it's pretty easy these days. There's the Harry Fox agency, which is a pretty likely place to find the music you want to license, or at least the Beatles were the, the Beatles and Nirvana on my third record. I did um, sliver, you know, the song goes, grandma, take me home, grandma, take me home. And I had Chris Novoselic from Nirvana play bass on it, which was great. Um, and so I have that one. And then the two Beatles records and uh, yeah, it's a Harry Fox agency. I just signed up with them. I do a quarterly accounting. I send them a spreadsheet. You know, I have to, I have to stare at spreadsheets and grab tiny numbers and put them in columns and stuff. So it's really glamorous, <laughs> but um, yeah, so far it's been flawless. It's really worked well. So uh, Don Hartley asks, what music delivery platforms are you seeing success with over your career? And what do you think will have longevity as far as people listening to music in the future? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, as far as Casper Baby Pants goes, it should be available on all, you know, the streaming stuff. Um, there is the issue with streaming stuff with the carbon footprint of the internet, which is significant. I saw a little short on it on the, uh, inter on the internet <laughs> the other day, uh, or not the other day, but a couple weeks ago. Anyway, um, I like the streaming thing. I actually finally signed up for Spotify as a fan of music, and I'm pretty amazed by it as a research tool, my plan is to find out all the albums I want to buy. And then I'll go to my local record store, Easy Street Records in West Seattle, and I will buy them there. Then I take them home and I burn them into my iTunes. And then I take them back to Easy Street and sell them back to them for a fraction of what I bought them for. So Easy Street benefits, I get music that I know I want. And uh, so I think Spotify is, I like to use it like that. I like to use it like a research tool. Anyway, um, as far as the future goes, I was thinking about that the other day. I was thinking, is there some way to get music to people that doesn't have a huge carbon footprint? I don't know, but if there is, I'll go with that way. Um, I know vinyl is having a resurgence. I did put, uh, I did release three different vinyl compilations in the last few years, limited edition. They're all gone now, sorry. I don't have any. <laughs> um, and that was kind of fun. Uh, generally, I, I, I'm a minimalist, so I don't resonate with vinyl. I don't want a wall of, stuff i'm very much into like you know my entire record collection is on this i, I love that i'm just like oh so little so um yeah i'm happy with things getting smaller and and uh digitized so andy hall says uh enjoy your work what prompted you to start ba casper baby pants well, the whole time I was doing The Presidents, I had this feeling, well, you know, The Presidents was just another band in a series of experimental bands that I was doing. And um, it just happened to hit. And in my mind, it was just a, a you know link in the chain. So I guess I was primed to kind of think what's next. But I also had this very clear sort of feeling like this isn't it. You know, this loud rock band is great. We achieved great things. We made a lot of people happy. But, you know, number one, it really hurt my ears. I had to wear ear protection all the time. Um, the lifestyle, the touring, all that stuff really started to take its toll on me. I'm, I'm a, I like feeling good. I like feeling healthy. I like eating good food. It was really hard to do on the road a lot of times. So I was hunting around for another thing. And as I did, you know, a lot of it was noisy and experimental and electronic. And I did that thing, Hijackers, and I did the thing with Sir Mix-a-Lot and a bunch of other bands that I'd start and stop. And none of it felt right. And then as it got simpler and simpler and more and more innocent and acoustic, um, I thought, you know, I don't know. I, I like where this is going, you know, aesthetically, but I don't have a vision i don't have a vision for what am i trying to say and who am i saying it to and i often think about that like as far as songwriting goes i imagine the listener or the user at the other end what is their experience what am i what do i want them to be doing like if i want them to be taking a nap then that dictates the palette of what i'm you know going to work with i'm not going to put a loud distorted guitar in that song because it's nap nap song so um i you know met my wife kate who does the album artwork. And when I saw her artwork, I thought, 
that's it. I want to make music that comes from that planet. And when I did, and when I really focused on making music that fit that style, it just occurred to me, it's music for kids. I'm supposed to be making music for little kids and specifically zero to six year olds. They're, those are my people. So um, yeah, it just, it, it was really like a long, long search and having success in the meantime, but not feeling like it was a hundred percent, like really me. Um, I always say like the, presidents were like a planet right and the core was innocent and the outer shell was innuendo so it's kind of like where the innocence and the innuendo kind of rub up against each other you got the friction of those like peaches kitty those songs and the casper thing is just the pure innocent core so there's no there's no um double entendre going on and and when i lost the pressure to have double entendre my creativity just went boom just out of control because it was like really who I am you know I'm like a kid I'm like a little I'm like I want to be a five-year-old basically uh so and and you know have fun and make noise and be a goofball so um so yeah it just fit me and it it fit my uh who I am and I've always kind of wanted to make music that really just represents who I really am and this is you know Casper's been the very much the closest thing so that's how I slid into it. Uh, Brian Web Weber says, parents are your people too, trust me. <laughs> yeah, well, I like to say, thank you, Brian. I like to say that I don't make kids music. I actually make parents music because I actually consider the parents probably about 85% of my decisions are for the parents. Because when you think about it, no child has ever bought an album of mine. It's all parents. So <laughs> I've got to serve the parents. Plus, I really, really empathize with the parents. I mean, when you're stressed out, especially first time parents, you're not sleeping, you're worried about are you doing the right things, um, all sorts of, you know, uh, progress markers of the ch child's growing up can be stressful to achieve. And, um, and people can feel isolated because they're stuck with their kid. And so anyway, I, I wanted to lighten the load. I want the music to function as a tool to help elevate the mood. It's not about me as much presenting myself as a clever songwriter. It's really like I'm making a tool that people can use. So that's the goal anyway. And that's where I get feedback that that works. So. Uh, Jack Quarantillo again says, yeah. uh, are your kids musical? Guessing they're no longer kids at this point. <laughs> yeah, Jack, they're no longer kids. Uh, Augie's 23. And Josie's uh, turning 21, or he's turning 24. Is he turning 24? Yeah. Wait, I, I've lost track. Oh, I can't believe I'm one of those parents that doesn't know how old my kids are. Oh, man. Yeah, he's uh, 23 and she's 20. Uh, they're both musical. Uh, Josie's in college and she does a bluegrass class and she's learning bluegrass and finger, you know, like finger picking stuff. And uh, she's got a great singing voice and she just likes music as a as a thing to accompany her life. Augie's a little more serious about it. He's been in band, many bands. He's proficient on bass and guitar and I gave him a synthesizer and he's totally into that. And uh, he repairs and builds guitars from scratch that are amazing. Uh, very unique, one of a kind stuff. Takes him a long time to build. He's got a really good electronics analytical engineer mind. And then he's got a really good creative mind. So Augie's, Augie's really digging into music and musical instruments in a really exciting way. Fantastic. Uh, Doug Heyman asks, what do you do to protect your ears? Oh, yeah. Well, in the, back when I, I was in Beck's band, uh, when he got signed and went on tour for the first two tours, and that band was loud. Uh, and so I had to wear like airport tarmac worker uh you know earmuffs because i i didn't know about or i couldn't afford you know the insert like pro molded ear plugs and everybody said i looked like i was receiving messages from outer space because <laughs> i had this like headset on but i just wasn't gonna i wasn't gonna give it up for that uh you know level of noise and then when the president started i did get the molded ear plugs and had those for many years with like little db fill like 5 db cut filters and those are great you could hear your uh fingers rubbing against each other you could hear everything it's just lower but when you sing with those in because half of or some percentage of what you hear 
uh, when you talk is the bones in your head resonating. Something happened. We recorded a bunch of shows in Australia for a live album, we thought. We came home, and this was before Pro Tools, it was tape. All my vocals were like 12 cents flat. So because of the way my voice was sounding in my own head. And so I realized, oh no, I've been doing all these shows, you know, slightly flat for all these years. So I got in-ear monitors and those were great, except the early versions, the plastic didn't age well and it would shrink and there'd be like gaps. And, and then I was shoving them in and I was turning them up too much. And that ended up kind of hurting me a little bit until I got better molds made. And now with the Casper thing, I don't have to protect my ears because it's just me. Um, I'm solo. I have total control over the sound and uh, I'm playing small venues a lot. Um, so it's really nice to not have that consideration anymore. Lately, with the music I've been making lately, I tend to mix it too loud and I come out of the studio with my ears ringing. I'm like, oh no, I did it to myself. <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, and I have tinnitus. I have a constant ringing in the ear, but it's pretty manageable. I actually kind of have tamed it with my mind because when it started, I was freaked out. And then I just kind of realized, you know what? Every job anybody has wears down a certain part of the body. That's just life. And so I just imagined that that sound in my head was the sound of my purpose on the planet which is to make music and make people happy. And with that, I kind of imagine just like turning this volume knob slowly down. And I kind of, I've kind of tamed it just mentally um, because if I didn't, I'd go insane. <laughs> uh, Jack asks, is your tinnitus also in D? Oh, uh, you know, I've never figured that out. <laughs> okay. Wait. I don't know. It's too high, I think, to figure out. I did have a problem when, you know, I have allergies now I, as I get older. And a couple of years ago, one of my eustachian tubes got plugged and it got plugged in such a way that every note that came into my ear produced another note six steps below it. And it was super annoying. I couldn't listen to music or have conversations even. There, It was so weird, but it cleared up eventually when the, when the pollen, you know, blew away. So but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what key it's in. I don't want to. I don't want to focus on it that much to figure it out. Leave it alone. Micro, uh, Michael Goudreau asks, "In what ne neck of the woods is your studio?" Uh, Seattle, Washington, specifically West Seattle, the original Seattle, the best Seattle, the only Seattle, West Seattle. And then uh, Chris Barrett asks. More of a business question here. What makes you the most money as an artist and how can your fans best support you? Oh, you know, Final merch downloads, etc. I appreciate that question, but really, I don't care. Um, I'm super interested in people getting the music who need it and want it. Um, I'm not worried about that kind of stuff. But I guess buying buying a CD from my wife, my wife uh, runs her website, Kate endel.com k-a-t-e-e-n-d-l-e.com she's selling these for me since i'm not doing shows so the best way is to buy a cd and we'll i'll sign it for you and we'll ship it to you and uh then you can you know digitize it into your little system uh on your own i think that's the best way that's the biggest margin so yeah but again however you get it is fine with me go ahead and steal it I don't care. <laughs> uh, Tiny Mule asks, what do you usually track first? Do you start with a rhythm section? Yeah, I usually start with a kick drum, uh, a metronome kind of thing. So I have like a file that's a kick drum. And believe it or not, the kick drum on all 18 Casper Baby Pants records is the same kick drum. That, that's one of my tricks to make it sound like they all fit together. So I've been using the same single little kick drum sample uh, for all that time. <laughs> so usually, yeah, I throw in that kick drum and I, I then I kind of uh, move it around uh, and repeat it and kind of change it around until I feel like that's the that's the you know right tempo. Um, and then I usually um, open up a mic and just sing and play the song to that tempo. Not this is none of this is going to be used. It's just to get the vibe, get the feel of the parts. Um, cause if I start, you know, constructing something to, um, piece by piece, 
it's real hard to get a feel. So then I'll start doing like a real bass to the scratchy one I just did, and then a real guitar to it, and another real guitar, and then a, a, vo a guide vocal, like a scratch vocal, and then I'll take away that loosey goosey one and then start building from there. So I'm kind of feelings hijacking myself, actually. In the end. And uh, we are out of questions. Wow, that means I've answered all questions everywhere in the world. It's true. <laughs> Unless someone gets on uh, typing again in the Q&A section, uh, which is at the bottom of your screen, you can click on the Q&A and type in your question and I'll, I'll ask it live. I can't ask a question on the Q&A um, as a panelist, so I'll have to ask it this way, Chris. Yeah. Do you have a kind of, as a really prolific songwriter like yourself, um, for other songwriters out there kind of wondering if you have any advice and also wondering if you have a specific kind of routine that you swear by as an artist and songwriter. Thanks. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I would say to other songwriters, something that's really worked for me, which I touched on a little bit before, is um, imagining the atmosphere in which you want your music to be listened to. You know, again, is it like somebody having coffee in a garden? Is it somebody at a show like banging their head? Is it somebody driving their car across country uh, because they're going to pick up the love of their life in California? I know that's specific, but <laughs> you can get specific. Um, the reason I like to start with stuff like that, and you know, in the case of Casper Baby Pants, it's zero to six year olds and their parents. And that's a very specific sonic palette to me. It limits your choices because there's a million ways you could go with a song or with riffs or with lyrics or whatever, you know, you need something to kind of be the guide, the guardrails to keep you on, on the road you're supposed to be on. Otherwise you just drive your car off the road and go into the desert and into a ditch and die. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think visualizing it can really help. And also uh, sometimes I'll just move my body to how I want them to move. Like if I want somebody to kind of be doing this, I'll do this and get that tempo from the movement instead of trying to, you know, intellectualize it, uh, just be physical about it. Um, and what was the second half of the question? The second half of the question was related to routine. Like, do you have, and I think also kind of thinking about how spontaneous you are in the studio. Uh, one question that I'm curious about is that, does that spontaneity come out of already having like the lyrics and the, the chords ready to go that allows you to do that? Or do you hmm. sometimes in the studio just let things flow and see what happens? Yeah, it's all of the above. I mean, sometimes I'll just, you know, I'll be in the middle of recording a song and I'll just put on a totally different beat and pick up a guitar and just do something off the cuff. Um, and it'll maybe turn into a song, maybe won't, but I just need to just be like right now in the moment, what am I doing? And then there's songs like I was describing earlier, like slugs in the dust took three years of walking around thinking about it. I actually saw some slugs going across a dusty road and I was just like the, the pathos of it all, <laughs> you know, like, are they going to make it? I just wanted to like bottle that like empathy that I felt for these slugs. But it took three years of pondering, you know, three years. Some songs are just like, set up a beat, let's go. Oh, it works. I have an idea. Boom. And, you know, that's kind of rare, actually. It just takes work. Like a lot of the time it takes work. Even when they come in a lightning flash, it takes work to then massage them into shape and like figure out, oh, you know, did I really do it in the right key? You know, uh, is there something special about the energy of this performance or can I change the key, maybe do it on a piano? and see what happens. So it's again, it's following like the gut instinct. Does this feel right? Does it feel wrong? You know, like, and then, you know, when it feels wrong, do the work. Like I'm, I can't tell you how true the 80, 20 rule is for me. It takes 20% of the effort to go 80% of the distance to the finish line. It takes 80% of the effort to go the last 20%. And I'm, I have to remind myself of that every time I go to finish a record. Cause it's, I'm constantly like just, you know, making notes, nitpicking, pushing the bass up just a tiny bit, testing it in the car, coming back, you know, like, so, you know, it's all over the place. The starting of the song is uh, everything from just like a moment of combustion to years of, of, you know, silent pondering. 
Uh, Chris Barrett asks, if you could play a new instrument, what would you play and why? A new instrument? Ooh, I'd love to be able to play like cello or violin. I'd love to be able to do real cello parts. I always hear cello and um, I have a, you know, like an app on my iPad that's like fakey strings. That's really good actually. Um, and uh, you know, I, I do this trick with strings when I record, which is kind of fun. I never record a string by playing more than one note. So if it's a cello, I just play one note like it's a real cello. And then I go to the next track and I do the next, I don't play pads. I play like each part as a single performance. And it's really interesting because it really makes it feel like a bunch of cellos versus like, you know, riffing like you'd riff with two hands on a piano. Um, but yeah, I'd love to be able to play strings. I tried violin when I was a kid and the first four lessons were all about how to hold the violin. And I was just like, I'm out. I can't, I can't, I can't hang, man. It's too much. Uh, clarinet I did too when I was a kid and I can still kind of you know, like fake the clarinet, but I don't have one at the moment. So. A uh, couple questions from Michael uh, Goudreau. When do you think live performances will return? And has Casper ever played live at Easy Street Records in West Seattle? Oh, yeah. Um, I think live shows will return. I, I'm not going to start booking until the, the restrictions on gathering are over. And I feel like maybe that could happen in the fall. That's what I'm kind of feeling. Um, and yes, I played Easy Street a bunch of times. The West Seattle Neighborhood Association uh, sponsors me to do a show there every December, like a holiday Christmas show. So I've done a whole series of shows at Easy Street, usually the like second Saturday in December. Um, so might be one this year if the, if everything goes to plan. So that'd be great. It's super fun to play there. I love Easy Street Records. Uh, you can order my albums online from Easy Street Records too, if you want, if you don't want to get them from Kate. But if you get them from Kate, I can sign them. So there's that. But yeah, love Easy Street, love Matt, and uh, yeah, greatest record store in the world. True. Uh, so the new style album, any rough ETA on that? And how will we be able to get it? Yeah, uh, I think I just did the final mix tonight, but you know, <laughs> I'm probably going to get in the car and be like, oh, the bass is all wrong or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's, it's on its way to completion. Um, and I'm going to release it through my distributor in Portland, Burnside Distribution. So we're going to kind of set it up. It'll take up three months or four months once I'm ready to deliver the master. So what are we in here? Uh, April, May, June, July, August, probably like August or September, probably September. Yeah. Um, and it'll be available because I'm going through the distributor. It'll be available everywhere for streaming. I don't think I'm doing physical product yet. I'd like to do vinyl eventually for these albums, and I'm kind of trying to make them with that in mind. Um, but at this point, I I don't think I'm going to press a thousand CDs. I don't know. I don't think I would really get through them. So I'm going to. This is going to be my first digital only. Uh, well, not really my first. But my first like album with songs. I've done instrumental albums on my website. Oh yeah, my website is chrisbalu.org. You can go there to listen to free ambient music that I make. I make sample, what I call sampladelic, kind of electronic music, and I do art. So you can go there and check all that stuff out. And um, I'll put the album up there too. And I think the album is called, I'm debuting the title, it's called I Am Not Me. Bam! Uh, Hold your applause. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I personally have a a question for you and I think you've alluded to it a little bit uh, in that you you are a do-it-yourselfer and you audition all your mixes in various places like a car stereo but do you do your own mastering I do I do actually I've always been a little mystified by mastering um, because uh, I don't know I, I I feel like I can handle that part I feel like mastering is mostly listening without really listening like for me I mastered all the Casper records and I have on my phone, I have this like um, spectral analyzer app and it's real simple. My son turned me onto it. It's this guy. Boop, 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 boop. And I just put it in the same spot in the room. It doesn't matter which spot, you know, if it, it doesn't matter if it's woofy, as long as it doesn't move. And I listen to the record and I look for 
I, I just look at this. And then also during all these like um, car listens and the Bose and uh, in the house and, you know, Bluetooth speaker and all that, a lot of times I just wait to feel something like this song, this song's not loud enough or this song's too muffled or this song's too sharp. Um, and just, I make a note like, you know, bring the high end down a little bit. So I feel like when I'm mixing, I'm also mastering kind of. And, uh, you know, basically I'm mixing and mastering from the moment I start recording. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it's really just listening uh, for me, just using my ears. Just I, I, yeah, pretending it, to be the guy listening to the album. So. It probably helps that you approach your work with the, um, the same intent of palette when you're starting out this, you know, yeah, you want all I, the Casper stuff to sound um homogenous or yeah i want it yeah. to all hang in the same and actually what i do is i take the first song on the first casper album and and put it in as my like cornerstone like it's i know it sounds great on every system and so i'll put it in and then i'll put in the new stuff i'm working on and listen like okay is the low end occupying the same world is it the same kind of energy uh and so yeah i've just mastered everything to the first song on the first record which works. And now that I'm doing this new style, I really plan to make a series of records in this new style. And so this first record, I'm trying to do the same thing. I'm trying to get like the palette really dialed in and, and make sure it works so that I can, you know, uh, back master, if you will, to the first song on the first record. Andy Hall asks, is there a radio friendly version of Kitty? Yes, there is. If you can find the Pop Llama a uh, version of our debut record which came out before the columbia sony release it has a beep because we thought it would be funny to beep the independent release <laughs> we thought we, we censored ourselves we made the beep because we just thought it'd be hilarious to beep our own record and then when we got on columbia they were like you got to take that beep off there you guys need a little bit of edge <laughs> we're like okay okay we'll take it off and you know it, you know, in the uh, later years of the presidents, we did like state fairs and places where there were families and stuff like that. So I would, I would either get on the mic and say, all right, now I'm going to swear in this song. Uh, so parents, it's your job to explain to your kids why it's okay to swear in rock and roll. Or I would change it to no fair kitty, if I had forgotten to do the speech or whatever. It has the F sound kind of works. No fair kitty. So uh, yeah, there were a couple of workarounds there, but yeah, if you can find the Pop Llama version, you'll get it. Great. Doug Heyman asks, speaking of GarageBand on iPad, have you tried the AirHoo? AirHoo? No, I haven't tried the AirHoo. Oh, goodness. Let me see if I can see what the Air, I don't know what the AirHoo is. E-R-H-U. E-R-H-U. Hold on. Let's let's figure this out. <laughs> We're gonna see. Come on now. Doug so, says it is in the World Instruments Sound Pack. Oh, oh, the instrument, the Air Who in GarageBand. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you mean. I have tried that. It's cool. Yeah, yeah. GarageBand's kind of an amazing tool. This this beat sequencer here, you can throw any acoustic kit in it or drum machines, and I use it as just a, a way to create feels, but they often end up in the songs. Um, I'm pretty impressed. I've got this Yamaha uh, piano, like a 73 key piano that um, go, works with the MIDI in here. So it's pretty awesome. Yeah. I've actually gotten rid of a lot of my outboard stuff and I just use these apps and the iPad and it satisfies my minimalist. I like, I've got such a minimal setup now. I used to have keyboards all over the place and now I've just got iPad and little piano. It's, it's nice. I don't know why I want so few things, but it just makes me happy. Uh, Jim Ballard wants to know, are you into Eno's, uh, Brian Eno's ambient stuff? Oh, 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 deeply, deeply. I mean, I was super into Roxy Music and then Brian Eno when I was breaking out of the Beatles phase in my teenage years. And then I bought the Apollo soundtrack um, album thinking it was another Brian Eno pop song record and put it on and went, what is this? This is terrible. And then like 10 minutes later, I was like, this is genius. You know, it completely uh, turned me. And when I was in college, I used to put that record on and just listen to it over and over and over. And I'd space out an entire Saturday, just 
just swimming in that record and his other like discrete music and music for airports and all that. It really, really resonated with me. And then many, many, many years later now, I've, I do meditation and something called Qigong every day, which is like a breathing motion kind of thing. And I, you know, use ambient music. So it turns out way in my past in college, I was meditating, but I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew that I, I wanted to space out for hours with uh, that music enveloping me. So yeah, big deal. I met Brian Eno once and it didn't go well. Oh no. <laughs> Yeah, he told me to beep off. Oh, <laughs> I beat myself. Yeah, that's a it's a story. Chris Barrett uh, <laughs> says, what studio would you like to record at and why? Example, Abbey Road. And he oh. also mentions Daniel Lanois. Oh, yeah, I love Daniel Lanois. His guitar playing. I mean, so good. Um, he's all over that Apollo record, of course. Um, a studio I'd want to record in, you know, it's, that's, I can't think of one. I mean, Abbey Road, yeah, that would be thrilling. But again, with the time thing, I just find that I have to record and then I have to let a song sit for a month and then record again and then sit for however long. It can take years of revisiting and being passive, um, a passive listener to figure out what's really going on. So I, I just can't imagine recording at any studio other than my own, you know, because I need time unless I could go to Abbey Road four times in the course of a year and record. That would be one way to do it, but I, I wouldn't be able to stand waiting. So I'd actually, okay, I would go to Abbey Road if I could own Abbey Road for a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, sky's the limit. Sure. Yeah, sure. You know, I'm deep pockets. Let's do it. So, so speaking of your studio, uh, Dan Mortensen would like you to, uh, can you move your camera around to show the studio? Yeah, kind of. I mean, it's, you know, it's a bunch of guitars on the wall. There's uh, guitars. There's my little uh, laptop and my inbox. Um, I've got these, what are they? I've got these French speakers. I, don't, I can't remember what they're called, but they were the ones like I went in with that first album and put the first song on the first album on in these speakers and it sounded exactly like it's supposed to sound. So I bought these speakers. There's my little Bose. I, I use the Bose Wave Radio as kind of like a tester for, you know, uh, you know how like these kind of units are so fascinated with bass. Everybody's everybody with like cheapy little uh, home systems so always like how much bass is there. So I always want to make sure that I'm not overwhelming the bass, which I kind of usually am. So, uh, and then over here is my little Yamaha keyboard with my iPad, and there's my one Rode NT2 mic. It was actually my second one, the first one I had for like 20 years and then it, it gave out. So, and I don't know, I didn't pick that one on purpose. I just, I just picked it. So, but I like it. I like it. It's, it's got a nice range. It reacts well to the whole room. It's good with up close. And, oh, and then I've got like, you know, well, let's see. I don't know if I can get that far. Down here, I've got a, a, a Ampeg tube amp and some effects. So it's pretty simple, you know? just a room a bunch of cds back there if anybody wants to buy uh 4, cds i can sell them to you <laughs> cheap kateendel.com uh so, and dan's follow-up question is oops hold uh, on i lost Are you I there? Got you. Go ahead. okay so dan's yeah. follow-up question is do you sit to play or is there room to stand up and emote oh i'm a sitter actually i'm a, I'm a sit guy yeah um generally when i'm playing i don't i don't i don't play with wild abandon a lot i kind of i'm doing a lot of like little parts and i find sitting is more solid um and i don't have straps on any of my guitars i will sometimes stand i'll stand if i'm doing like background vocal like trying to make a gang of background vocals i'll kind of dance around the room and move about and jump around but if i'm doing guitar parts or stuff like that i'm i'm sitting i like the control uh, and again, we're down to the last question in the Q&A panel here. So again, if you have any more questions, queue it up here for me. But Brian Weber would like to know, is your music, is your free music DMCA free, or would it need to be licensed for use in videos or streaming? If it needs to be licensed, what is the best way to do that? Oh, yeah. No, it's not free to license. Uh, it, it actually, a lot of the electronic -y stuff that's on chrisblue.org used to be and still is part of a 
library of music that I created over the course of 10 years. It's about 700 pieces or so um, that I licensed to commercials and TV shows and all that stuff through a company called Marmoset in Portland. So you might want to look at Marmoset, um, but if you they don't have everything. So if there's something on crispaloo.org that Marmoset doesn't have, um, you can just email me and we'll work it out. I'm, I'm not only the engineer, the songwriter, the performer, and the uh, distributor, I'm also the license, licensing uh, agent. Uh, so Andy Hall asks, what do you listen to for inspiration? What do you listen to just to listen to? Yeah, that's a good question. Right now, I'm really into uh, Jose Gonzalez, um, his solo records and his records with Junip. Um, fantastic i just i can't he does so this is something i would like to ask audio engineers out there if anybody's familiar with the junip record fields i don't know how they do this but the song will start out it's a lot of nylon string guitar uh soft voice and synthesizers and some you know dr mellow drums and stuff as the songs build and get bigger they also get more distorted and kind of crushed together and it's the most satisfying kind of distortion this extremely harmonic wonderful fuzzy ball of distortion um i don't know how they do it. it and i i haven't been able to figure it out um or read anything about that specific aspect of producing that band so that's what i'm really into right now i'm really into this kind of like psychedelic -y acoustic like where acoustic guitars and synthesizers kind of fight for space and um trippy lyrics and uh, not necessarily fancy chord progressions. I like, I'm really into chord progressions that are kind of like so satisfying that you don't mind hearing them over and over for four minutes. Um, and then I listen to a lot of ambient music. Uh, Harold Budd is one of my favorite piano players. Um, uh, I've been listening to these like, you know, Tibetan bowls, you know, like dong dong, you know, like uh, that kind of stuff. And then I've been going through like a you know phase where like listening to old records I haven't had for a long time. Like I was into the I was super into the Velvet Underground back in college, and I'm diving back into that. I haven't listened to the Velvet the Velvets since then. So anyway, using Spotify again to kind of just like bounce around and experiment. What is your favorite song you have ever done? Like that I've created. Whew. Whew. Oh boy, you know, I off the top of my head, I'd have to say Lump, the president's single that became a hit. I never, ever felt anything but 100% present and excited every time we performed it. Every time we performed it, it was like the first time we were playing it. And it always made the crowd go crazy. And I was really proud of the abstract quality of the lyrics. The big question was always like, what is Lump about? What is Lump about? <laughs> Meanwhile, it's just about exactly what I'm singing about. It's this weird, surreal, psychedelic vision of a woman in a housecoat in a river being, you know, confusing the piranhas. <laughs> uh, so I don't know why. I don't know why. You know, part of it was when the president started out, I was really into Lenny Kravitz. I loved his records because they were that, that dry, tape compressed, really clear, every instrument right there available uh, kind of production was so great. I just didn't quite resonate with his lyrics. I felt they were a little instructional, like here's how to fix the world. I, I tend to more want to sing about here's what the world looks like once it's fixed. Like you can communicate with slugs and dance around with frogs and be surreal and relaxed. And so that's kind of, I kind of wanted to take Lenny Kravitz's music and put my own surreal action into that lump wasn't exactly that but it was it came out of the idea of taking other bands that i loved and and injecting my sort of uh, attitude and uh, one of the reasons i love playing two string is i could wear my influences on my sleeve and it sounded fresh like mach 5 was me trying to write a, a kiss song uh, lump was me trying to write a buzzcock song so all the songs had this like i want to pay homage to my you know influences but i want to make it my own so lump did that really well and uh and it was short and just exciting so yeah and my favorite and, and catchy and a crowd favorite yeah i mean what what more do you want yeah <laughs> and it was a hit it was like it wasn't 
it's not just an album track. And I, I was so satisfied to have a hit with a song I loved, you know, like dug that. Uh, Jack Karen, uh, Quarantillo again asks, is the new album instrumental? No, there... no, it's definitely lyrics. It's full on lyrics. Yeah. Very trippy, weird, abstract lyrics. It's kind of like the anti Casper. It's like one day I, I was done with the Casper thing for a while. And so I, I started plugging in fuzz guitar and I was just like, yeah, I forgot about distorted electric guitar. Cause there's, there's like maybe five seconds of distortion on, on the 18 albums of Casper. Uh, music so uh it's sort of like me getting all my <laughs> like everything that's not casper is in this record <laughs> so yeah but it is lyrics for sure songs very i hope very hooky singable songs uh and then what effects do you use echo reverb etc yeah pretty much echo reverb i i lately with the psychedelic stuff i'm doing i've been getting into phase shifting and flanging and chorus and stuff like that um and then Pro Tools has a couple of like plugins that are like distortions where you can really uh, clue in on the uh, frequency and, and make it, you know, modulate and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, really, it's just re reverb and echo and lack of reverb and echo. I kind of find that I like to play with, uh, you know, especially in the Casper stuff where there's more space. I can play with, um, you know, front and back with dry and reverb. Reverb is an incredible thing. I mean, you can slide reverb just a little bit and change the story of the song really like you know uh how it you know how the um the the story or the uh, intention of the song can change with reverb is just mind-boggling so I'm, i have enough to deal with with echo and reverb and then i have some i have some guitar effects this thing is amazing fuzz stang it's a gated fuzz pedal so you can gate the sound so you can get absolute fuzz distortion and then nothing, no feedback because you've gated it. So you can do super like rhythmic fuzz. I actually bought that for a Casper song. Um, can't remember which one now, but there is one song on one of these last two records that has fuzz guitar. <laughs> anyway. Oh, oh, and then I should just name check this guy. I've had this since uh, I was in junior high school. It's a Boss Super Overdrive. And it's just still, it's still going. So thanks, boss. Uh, you said you frequently high mic on the neck on the nylon string. Yeah. Do you have any other mic positions you love or other guitars that would just work really well? Yeah, this guitar here, man, this is the most incredible acoustic guitar. It's a, a Harmony Broadway. And it has this really, I don't know if it translates to Zoom. has this very limited mid-range kind of thing to it it's not woofy it's not super bright these strings have probably been on there for like 10 years um i actually just bought this thing a couple years ago but weirdly in boston i helped a guy move in 1989 and he gave me a guitar unseen it was in a guitar case took it home and ended up tracking a ton of songs that later became you know big deals for me like some president songs and it was this guitar. It was the exact same model. And I walked into a rec. Uh, I lost it somewhere along the way. I have no idea what happened to it. I walked into Thunder Road Guitars in West Seattle, plug, plug. And uh, this guitar was hanging on the wall. I took it down and literally went like this. I'll take it because it was the same sound. It was like the sound of all those four track recordings was back. And I like to pretend that it is the same guitar and it somehow found me. So uh, anyway, was that answering the question? What was the question? <laughs> oh, just, you know, were there, are there any other favorites, uh, mic oh. positions or, yeah. or instruments that yeah. you, the, that you go to? Yeah, this one is, is revolutionizing recording acoustic guitar. I really barely have to put EQ on this thing when I mic it and I mic it usually kind of like the mic is kind of, I like to mic acoustic guitars near where my ear is because that's how I'm hearing the guitar. I don't think you ever listen to acoustic guitars like this, like right in, I, I don't like miking them, you know, right on the guitar. I like it kind of up here. 
So I just take this this mic I've got and I just go like that. I tilt it down and then I kind of put the guitar here and wear headphones and, and find the right spot. So yeah. But really the mic, it's either it's either down for acoustic guitar or up for vocals. And that's it. <laughs> Those are the two positions that it goes in. That's great. Do you collaborate with your kids on musical projects? Um, you know, I haven't yet. I thought for this psychedelic record I'm making, I was going to have Augie play synthesizer on it, but he's got his own life going on and I sent him some mixes and it didn't, you know, we didn't keep it going. So um, I would love to eventually. I think Augie and I will probably do something weird and experimental. He's got a, he's got a good brain for the stuff I'm doing now. Um, he's into the weird. So that's cool. Uh, and then Josie and I, yeah, we exchange we, when we're in the same place, which is lately not happening because she's in Colorado and I'm here, but, uh, you know, we play, we strum guitars and she teaches me songs that she loves and she turns me on to new music and I turn her on to stuff. And so, and we share a really great kind of aesthetic. There's a band called the Do, D-O, and it's got a slash through the O. Uh, that she and I both just love. They're really cool. Great. So yeah, so far, uh, although actually on some of these albums, these Casper albums are songs that they have written when they were little kids. Uh, like which one? I, I know there's, well, I can't remember now. Where is it? Oh yeah, Augie. Augie did lyrics on five. What is it? Oh yeah, Animals Talk. He wrote this song when he was a little kid. So they're, they're, they're scattered around on the Casper albums. Right. Well, uh, again, the Q&A panel is blank. I've got nothing queued up. Well, that's perfect because I got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> shall we uh, Shall we start wrapping up? Greg, sure. do you want to chime in? Yeah, let's take these last two questions, uh, okay. Matt, and uh, then we'll conclude. Thanks. Yeah, so two more questions just popped in. Okay. Uh, someone recently asked Sir Mix a lot about the possibility of releasing the Suns subset album. Subset, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I'm, I've told him multiple times, go for it. I'm happy to have you release it. Um, at the time, last time we spoke about it, I was so involved with Casper. I was kind of like, just you do it. Uh, I give you my thumbs up. Now I'm in a spot where I could maybe see being a little more involved in it. It gets tricky with that album because there were a lot of fingers in the pie. And one of the reasons that collaboration went separate ways is there was there were kind of different camps about the philosophy of it the creativity part of it and um so reconciling all that and getting enough people to agree to it and be in the same room and on the same page about it might make it hard i know that the album like songs not the not an album but a bunch of songs were floating around on napster of all things back in the day so you might be able to find it on the dark web <laughs> or something. Um, but yeah, it'd be nice if it saw the light of day. Uh, it was super fun. We did a West Coast tour. I had so much fun working with Mix. He taught me so much about recording. He's got a real pro studio and um, we did all the tracking there. And, and he, again, he exposed me to recording with computers and uh, revolutionized my world. So, you know. We're, we'll be tight for life, but uh, I hope the I hope the subset record come out. It's some good stuff. We were fun live. I'll tell you, I've got a couple of live shows recorded that are hilarious. Okay, and uh, we'll we'll call this the last question from Mr. Matt the Turtle Man. Oh, I want to get a twelve string acoustic Taylor, and oh. when I look at the eight hundred or the fifteen hundred dollar ones. Do you find that the $800 guitars get the job done just as well as the $1,500 guitars? And with the uh, comment that context is, you've probably had moments where it's not a big deal to get the $1,500 ones. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, my philosophy with personally with guitars is the cheaper, the better, generally. I actually, uh, I bought a, I spent like a thousand dollars on a guitar once and I couldn't play it because it was a thousand dollars. I just couldn't like a lot, all my guitars are like old silver tones and harmonies and they're, they were all purchased for somewhere around 200, $250. Um, I think this one that I was showing before the Broadway was maybe 600, which was kind of a big deal, but it sounded so good. 
I mean, I don't know uh, what the difference is between those two models. It could be just like the quality of the hardware, you know, like the the uh, metal used in the tuning pegs, or I think probably the body and the the way it resonates and sounds might be this just the same. Um, one might have, I don't know, a truss rod and the other doesn't. I'm not sure, but um, my son actually, I think just bought a Taylor 12 string and it was a cheaper one and he loves it. So I would, uh, yeah, I would go with the $800 one and spend the rest on food. <laughs> and, and sorry, uh, last, last question. You mentioned last the speakers question. in this studio being French. Are they from Focal? Oh, they are. Yes, that is the name. And I love them. They've been great. They do have like they don't expose low end issues. That's why I kind of reference in the bows or sit in the back of the room. Um, there's a yeah, there's, they drop off a little before like the big fatty subs that might be a problem. Uh, but the mids are totally neutral. Do you, uh, do you know what model they are? Ooh, let me see. Hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh my, hold on. This is good. This is good TV right here. Uh, <laughs> they are focal uh, Alpha Fifty. Alpha Fifty. Yeah, Focal uh, Alpha Fifties. So, and a couple of people have said, uh, "Please say thank you." Amazing, uh, great Q and A. Oh, good. I'm glad people enjoyed it. Yeah, this it's been fun. Uh, Hope it was uh, informational and maybe inspiring. And um, yeah, it's nice to be asked to talk about myself for an hour and a half. <laughs> well, thank you, Chris. Yeah. And thank you, Greg. Good meeting. Yeah. yeah thanks so much, Chris. This has been really inspiring to learn more about your process and uh, your work. And I can't wait to hear the new project and hopefully get a chance to see you play live again. Yeah, yeah, look, yeah, very much look forward to that. Uh, I'm looking like forward to something I was doing before the pandemic is Casper Adult Pants. It's where I play Casper Baby Pants songs with distortion at a bar late at night to drunk parents. Okay. So no kids allowed. So Fun. I'm hoping I'm hoping to do some more of that once the pandemic is over. So that's one way you can you can also you can have a beer and come see me. <laughs> Sweet. Well, thanks again, Chris. And I'd like also like to thank Matt for the incredible job with q and I'd also like to thank the committee of the Pacific Northwest section for all of your help. And also I'd like to thank Alex Kosorek for helping us with this webinar tonight. And um, thank you all for being here. I hope that you've had a great time. Take care. Yeah, yeah that's great. All right, thanks. See you all later. Bye-bye.